I, I thank you for this wonderful church and, and the work that she's doing here in Armona. Um, I pray, Lord, that uh, you would just uh, send laborers, Lord, uh, into, into your harvest. And I, Lord, I pray, as I, I, even as I prayed that, I pray that we can be uh, those laborers that we're praying for, Lord, and uh, in that as we go forward this morning, that you just allow your word to rest in our hearts and to move us this morning uh, into sharing the gospel with others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Jesus teaches us an important lesson about being a laborer for the Lord here, actually in John chapter 4. Um, and this is about soul winning. So this is about evangelism. Being a laborer for the Lord is winning souls to the Lord. Our main passage today is going to be these verses in uh, John chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 35. It says, Still four months... Then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may re rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I set you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him uh, to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now after the two days he departed there from, sorry, from there and went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. And so he, sorry, I went too far. I accidentally added extra verses onto this. So we we're going to stop there at verse uh, um, 41. Or actually, no, I, sorry about that, 42. So the passage here in verse 35 to 42, Jesus actually shows us what it means uh, to be a soul winner and, and that there's two parts to being a soul winner. There's sowing and reaping. And we see that uh, here in this passage. And so we see that soul winning requires both sowing and reaping. So sowing, the casting out of the seed, and reaping is the harvest, right? And so let's look at sowing here for a moment. In agriculture, sowing involves preparing the soil and planting the seed. And so the method that they actually used mostly was actually casting out of the seed. So they, they actually would you know, prepare the soil and they would walk around and they would literally throw the seed onto the ground. And you know, they, would just, they was all focused on getting as much seed out there as you could. And that seed would then take root when they would water it. And uh, they didn't actually always plant it in the ground like that. They threw it on top and watered it and waited for it to take root. In winning souls to Christ, this is very much the same. Uh, sowing, likewise, uh, involves preparation and planting and that casting, uh, in which hearts are being prepared to receive the gospel. And so uh, the sowing is preparing the hearts to receive the gospel. We don't always see that, see the fruits of that. Sometimes it takes a while. So is when hearts are first introduced to the gospel. This is a process that involves time, teaching, influence, and it often has very little visible results at that time. And so it's very easy to get discouraged with 
sowing sometimes. And we're going to talk about this, why we should not be discouraged uh, when we don't see results immediately. That's not even the way that sharing the gospel was necessarily designed, right? Jesus didn't, it, we, the same people very often are not the ones that are going to reap. So one sows, another reaps. And so the one sowing doesn't always see the results of the reaping. Now let's look at reaping for a moment. In agriculture, again, reaping is the harvesting of what has been sown. And so reaping is actually uh, the end part of the work. It's, a, it's actually the easier part. See, they have to do all of that work. You know, it takes months and months and months to grow something. But then when you're picking it, that's the easy part. In winning souls to Christ, this is very similar. Again, reaping involves a similar harvest, right? This is involving souls that have already heard the word of God from somewhere else. It's is involving people that uh, have already decided to obey the word. This is a process that involves conversion, right? This is what gives us great joy and excitement because it's, everybody likes to see when, that moment when someone gets saved, right? And so that's what we tend to gravitate towards is the reaping aspect. But sowing is incredibly important. So this morning, let's look at this. We may sometimes be the ones sowing and not reaping. Now, a lot of times when we see people and they're coming to church and everything, that's a lot of times the sowing's already been done and that's when we get to see the reaping. The sowing's done usually outside of this place or when we're inviting people to come to church with us. Here in John chapter 4, we actually see the sowing first. Uh, we don't see the reaping immediately. Uh, Jesus actually starts the sowing here uh, with that whole conversation with the woman at the well, right? Jesus is actually sowing seeds there. Uh, Jesus has this whole conversation with her, which he talks about, you know, that he is the, you know, you drink from him that will never go thirsty, right? And he's telling her about the gospel, essentially. And then what we read, uh, or what we can read after that, is that this woman uh, then goes into the city and starts telling people, she goes, could this be the Christ? And so she's attracting more people to Jesus. And so she does a bit of sowing there. In John chapter 4, verses 39 uh, through 42, uh, let's look at these verses again. It says, And many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. So first, it, you know, the, she goes in and tells them, He told me all that I ever did. So that when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him and we know not that this is indeed, or sorry, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the savior of the world. And so Jesus starts off the sowing with the woman and then the woman goes and tells people in the city. And then you notice that Jesus is involved in this whole process because those people end up, end up coming back to Jesus and they say, well, it was not just because of her word, it, it's because of what we heard from Jesus directly. And so we need to be careful not to take credit throughout these things as well because Jesus is the one that's going throughout the whole, is doing it throughout the whole process. We can often be in this position there are times when a lot of sowing is being done. Lives are being influenced uh, by the godly examples of other Christians. People are being taught the word of God. That's all sowing. We're out there 
spread, casting seed. We're sharing the gospel with as many people as we can. We're influencing people by how we live. Yet the reaping is not always enjoyed by the ones doing the sowing. Few seem to respond to our efforts at the time. Much time and energy is expended uh, with little immediate results. That's an important key word there. Little immediate results. See, because there are results. It's just we don't always get to see it at that time. It's, God doesn't work on our time, right? I've heard many stories from people where it took years for, some, for the gospel to get through to them. You know that seeds can actually last for years and like for a really long time. So it, even if you just were to put them in your kitchen cabinet, right, they, would la they can last up to like five years uh, be without being planted. And then under the proper conditions, seeds can last over 100 years. And then you can still plant it and it'll still, uh, it'll still grow and give fruit, right? So we need to remember that when we're casting our seed, right? When we're throwing that seed out, that can last a long time. You don't know how long it's going to take for each individual person for it to take root. But we have to tell people. We need to have perseverance in sowing. Those sowing with little visible reaping may think that they have failed. That's a common thing. You know, if, if you're out there telling people about Jesus all the time and you're seeing that people very rarely come, you know, have a moment where they accept Christ, that can be discouraging. You might be like, well, what am I doing wrong? Well, you might just be a sower. That's, that's okay. Someone else may do the reaping later. You know, I, I'm reminded of, um, there's a, a man, I'm not going to give his name or anything, but uh, there's a man that I was told about that is at one of our sister churches. And um, various preachers, so they didn't have a pastor for a long time, so various preachers had gone to that church. And he was regularly going, but he didn't believe. Right, And so various preachers had talked to this man over and over and over again. And he wasn't responding to any of them. He would ask questions all the time, but he wouldn't, wouldn't, come, he wouldn't actually get saved. He was fighting it, right? Took years and years. Then recently, uh, this man, uh, now they have, that church has a pastor, and this man got saved. And this man called some of those preachers that came and spoke to him and told them that he got saved. But it took years for that man to actually accept Christ. You see, we don't always see the immediate results, but God's word does get through to people. So we need to have that perseverance there. Uh, this can be tempting to... Uh, it tempt us, when we don't see results, this can tempt us to discontinue our efforts, to stop, you know, to give up. But we need to not do that. Like, we, like I said, with that man, it took that long of time, and it was worth it. It was worth it. Because it, without all of those preachers telling him about that, he may not have come to know. We don't know. Others may think that those who sow with little visible reaping, uh, they, they may think that others are failures. So if you look at people and you see that they're out there all the time uh, telling people about Christ and they don't seem successful, it's tempting to think that those people are failures when we look at them. But that's, again, not true. See, we can sometimes pres presume that they're not sowing the seed or uh, presuming that they're not actually very diligent in their efforts. When the efforts uh, to sow appear to produce little fruit, we should not draw conclusions about this hastily. It, this only leads to discouragement. 
We have to remember that true saying that Jesus said, one sows, another reaps. This leads me to my next point. See, whereas oftentimes we are the ones sowing, well, sometimes we may be the ones reaping as well. We can see the the reaping here in this passage, and this is actually pretty awesome what Jesus says to the disciples. Uh, He says, uh, so Jesus sends his disciples uh, to reap where others have labored, right? Uh, In John chapter 4, verse 38, it says, I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Why? Because Jesus had already done it. The woman at the well had already done it. The disciples were then to go in and talk to these people that have already been talked to. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. So who had done the sowing, right? So like I said, Jesus in conversing with the woman at the well, uh, you can read this uh, in John chapter 4 verses 5 through 26. That's that whole passage. That is Jesus doing sowing there. He is sowing seeds. Then you see the woman in verses 28 through 30 uh, in telling those in the town about Jesus, where it started in verse 28, says, The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come and see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out from the city and came to him. So that was that woman's role in that. So Jesus amazed her. Jesus spoke to her. And then she goes out and tells others. That's, that, that's the whole process of what we're supposed to be doing. When we come to know Jesus, we're supposed to go out and tell other people about him. That way they can come to know him as well. The disciples were to benefit from the sowing that was done by others. Uh, it's, I, I think it's a little bit funny here the way Jesus is saying this to them. You know, he's giving them a mission to go out and reap. And he said, by the way, you didn't do all the work. Uh, The work's already been done for you. So, in other words, stay humble. Uh, don't, Don't think too much of yourself when you're doing this reaping. But Jesus was also a part of the reaping. So we talked about how Jesus was a part of the sowing. But he's also a part of the reaping. And we see this here in verse 42. It says, then they said to the women, now we believe not because of what you said, For we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So when we tell people about Christ, we're not the ones winning them to Christ. We get them to that point where they're just available to see Christ, and then Christ does the rest. That's what happened here. And so we can often be in this position as well, in the position of the reaper. Right? Not, no, not the Grim Reaper, but <laughs> the Harvester, right? I always, get, I always thought, it's, I think it's funny talking about reaping. You know, I, it's Halloween too, so I don't know. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, it says, there are times uh, when people seem ripe, right? Ripe for the harvest or white for the harvest, right? Uh, that term white for the harvest, that was when things were blooming. They were ready to be picked right? And so this is ready to be harvested here. There are times when we can definitely see that. And actually, I believe that we see that a lot in churches, right? When people are starting to get, you know, when people are questioning and they're starting to really catch on to things. And you can see when they're just, a, like, they're just on the borderline, right? They're just about to get it. It's just about to click. It's an amazing moment because you can really see it in people. Sometimes, I mean, it's easy for a preacher because you can see them during the invitation and they're clutching onto the pew in front of them and their fingers are turning white. They're grabbing it so tight. That's, that's when you know that uh, someone's about ready to accept Jesus. They're ready to obey the gospel. This requires very little effort on our part. Again, remember, this was likely, to, likely due to the sowing that occurred already sometime earlier. You see, if they're here at church, they're here at church for a reason. They're here at church either because somebody brought them, 
somebody told them about the church. Nobody, nobody comes to church that has never opened up a Bible or never heard the Word of God at all. It very like You don't hear about that. Like, like, oh, I was just passing by. I saw this building. I have no idea what that cross means on the front of it, but I decided to go inside. You ever hear about that? Not really. Somebody told them. Somebody shared with them. Somebody invited them to church. We often benefit from the sowing that is done by others. So we need to be humble in reaping. We need to remember that, you know, th th this, you know th this experience that we get to be a part of when somebody is won over to Christ, it's not just us. We're not just the ones doing the work. The work's already been done for the most part. We might think sometimes that uh, if we're the ones, you know, with them when they pray and come to know Jesus, we might think that we've won those souls ourselves. That's not true. Even if we discard the work that other people have done, it's still Christ that won the souls. We might think that those who go out and convert a lot of people well, they, they, they are great soul winners by themselves. They, you know, they, they can be celebrities sometimes. Well, no. Because again, other people have done a lot of that work. They're benefiting. They get to be in that position. Reaping does not always reflect where the hardest work has been done. We should be careful not to boast if we are privileged enough to reap where others have sown. Yet, we can rejoice for the reaping even when others have sown. Uh, is an ex it's an exciting time for all of the laborers. We can rejoice together. You know, one sows, another reaps, that, though, that both may rejoice. So here's, here's the main point today. We need to be diligent to do both of these things. We need to not uh, favor one or the other. When we have opportunities, we need to pounce on them. When we have opportunities to sow, which is actually, there are far more opportunities to sow than there are to reap. There's really always an opportunity to sow. So we need to be diligent uh, in sowing. There will be times when we will mostly be sowing the seed, right? We'll mostly be casting the seed. There's going to be those times. We'll go through phases of life, or this church will go through phases where it's just casting seed, Mark 16, 15, it says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. To every creature. That means casting it out as much as you can. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. There may be times when we see little fruit in these efforts. There are many examples in the Bible about this. And just a couple of them, one from the Old Testament, is Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. He prophesied for nearly 50 years with little success. 50 years. But he kept doing it. And then Paul. Paul's a good example of the new, in the New Testament. We think, oh, well, Paul converted a lot of people, right? Yeah, that's true. Paul, Paul converted a lot of people. Paul, who is considered to be one of the greatest evangelists ever, well, if you read in the book of Acts, he was thrown out of cities, right? And he says he dusted himself off and he kept going. Paul was thrown out of cities. And we look at him as one of the greatest evangelists ever. Paul didn't get discouraged. Again, he dusted himself off and he kept going, right? We can take comfort 
in knowing that God's word is never sown in vain. It will accomplish its purpose. Isaiah 55, verse 10 through 11 says, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. The word of God will accomplish its purpose. The Word of God also has power to save those who believe it. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For it has power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. The Word of God has power. We also see in the book of Romans that sowers of God's word are needed. It's, we're actually needed. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 17, it says, For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, that preacher there, that's not talking about me. That's not talking about someone behind a pulpit. That's talking about all of us. The word preach means to proclaim expecting a result. To proclaim expecting a result. So that when we tell people about Jesus, we should expect a response. And then it says, And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Remember, they wore sandals at that time. Their feet would have been filthy from all of the walking that they did. Dirty feet were beautiful to God. Who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, The Lord who has believed our report... And then it says, this is, this is Paul's conclusion on this. He goes, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So even if we never reap, even if we go our whole lives and we never reap, which I doubt that will happen, but even if we never do, we can rejoice in the work of sowing knowing that our laborers for the Lord are not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So sowing is not a work that is done in vain, even though we, we may not see the results. I'll tell you where we will for sure see the results in heaven. Won't that be a beautiful day? Of all the seeds that have been sown and reaped, we will be up there and we will see it. We'll see the results of the labor. That's, that's a beautiful thing to think about. I want heaven to be a crowded place. I want, I want there to be standing room only in heaven, right? Right? Can you imagine? Can you imagine if you were the only one that was saved? How you know, it wouldn't wouldn't be right, right? I mean, we know that that's not that that's not the case. But if you think about that, think about we as saved people, we can only know for sure that we are saved. So we have to tell people about Christ. You don't want to be lonely in heaven, right? I don't think you're going to be, but we need to think about that. We want heaven to be a crowded place. 
We also have to be diligent in reaping. So not only diligent in sowing, we can't put all our focus on that, but we also have to be diligent in reaping. There may be times where we may reap where others have sown. People, again, who come to us wanting to study, ready to obey. People who come to us because others have sown and we are merely privileged to be the ones who reap. There may be times when there is much reaping with little effort. Where people seem quick to respond. Where we have numbers of members that may increase. Yet we should be cautious not to boast about those things. You see, the, the power is not in us. The power is in the seed. It's in God's word that is being sown. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I just want you to see here that it's, God, it, that it's the power of God's word. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints of ma and marrow. And it is, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So look at that first part of that verse. For the word of God is living and and powerful. It's not us. It's not in the sower or the reaper, right? It's in the seed. It's in the Word of God. We share the Word of God with people, and it does the work. God does the work. God is the one who also gives the increase. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 through 7 says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed? As the Lord gave to each one, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters but God who gives the increase. See, we talked about through this passage that Jesus was involved in every single part of it, right? He was involved in the sowing. He was involved in the reaping. Who was doing all of it? It was Jesus. We, were, we, just, we just get to be a part of it. Yeah, I, I, the, this reminds me of an uh, analogy that someone made for me one time that, you know, when we talk about doing evangelism and stuff, and we need to not boast because he's really the one that's doing it all. Does God want us to do things because he can't do it? No. God wants us to do things so that we get to be a part of it. And the analogy goes something like this. You know, when, uh, I, when I was a kid, I, I don't think people really do this anymore, but I was probably one of the last generations to do this. Well, I got sat on my dad's lap and I got to uh, steer the wheel of, of the car, right? Now, it's, people would be like, oh, that's too dangerous. Well, that's, that's what people did. So <laughs> I, got to, I was so excited I got to steer the wheel, right? I couldn't touch the pedals, my, but I got to put my hands on the wheel. Now, was my dad really not in control of that car? No. I, I, he was, of course he was in control. I wasn't really driving the car. But I got to feel like I was, right? I got to be a part of it. God does that with us. You see, when we're out telling people about Christ, it's not because he can't do it. It's because he wants us to be a part of it. As we reap, we need to be, remind, uh, we need to be mindful of, of the contribution of others, including God. We need to always remember that God is through it all. And we're, we can rejoice together in the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 8 says, Now he who plants 
uh, and he who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. And then John 4, 36, it says, And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. See, it's, there's no difference. We both rejoice together, okay? So if we're out doing the reaping, uh, we need to be humble when we're doing that. When we're out doing the sowing, we should be encouraged that someone else may come along and do, do the reaping. We need to not get discouraged at those times. In conclusion this morning, as the pianist and song leader come, I want to read this ver these verses from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38 one more time. It says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues. He's showing example here of how to do this, by the way. Uh, he says, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, notice what Jesus, it says, Jesus. It says, he was moved with compassion for them. We need to be moved with compassion over the multitudes because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. That should be all of our prayer. And if we pray that prayer, we need to know that we might be those laborers. If you're not saved this morning, come to know Jesus. I mean, it, it's a simple thing. You know, if you're here this morning and someone has sown that, would you obey it this morning? Like God's word says, would you repent this morning of your sins and come to know him as your Lord and Savior? Then you will get to spend eternity with him. Like I said, I want heaven to be a crowded place. I want to see everyone in this room in heaven. Okay? I want us all to be up there rejoicing together. That's all you have to do this morning is repent and believe. Just do that and you'll be saved. You'll know him. Uh, if, if you know him, you will be with him throughout eternity. That's an awesome thing. So do that this morning. Don't leave here without doing that.